Welcome to the New York State Museum. My name is Jennifer Lamack. I'm the Chief Curator of History here at the, at the museum. Um, we have a treat for you today and you're going to have to bear with us through some of our technical difficulties because we are filming live in history storage. Uh, we've got cords running from the hallway um, and we're hoping that we get hot spots and all that so we can bring you the Weitzman Stoneware Collection. The Weitzman Stoneware Collection is one of our most prized collections here in the History Department. Um, it was donated all by Adam Weitzman from Owego, New York. In 1996, he donated 125 pieces of decorated stoneware, and the collection has grown exponentially. Since then, we currently have over 500 pieces in the collection, um, and it's growing by the day. Um, Adam is a, a pleasure to work with, and we are all so grateful that he has amassed such a wonderful collection. Um, Adam has been collecting stoneware since he was a kid, um, and what makes his collection unique is that he specifically seeks out the highly decorated and the very rare uh, pieces. Um, also, a few years ago, he uh, donated money so we could um, put this collection into book form, um, written by John Shear, who I'm going to introduce in a moment. Um, so this is available here in the museum shop on Amazon and through RIT Press. Um, so before all of this, or while this COVID um, business was happening, I was planning on coming and giving the stoneware tour by myself. And then I asked my colleague, John Shear, if he would join me. And I am thrilled that he has. John Shear um, is our curator emeritus. He was the curator of decorative arts here at the museum for 42 years. Yes. 42 years. He retired in 2009 and he has been coming in since then. So we are thrilled about that. Uh, but John Shear is our resident stoneware expert. Um, he is the author of the book. And so he and I will both kind of take you through the stoneware collection. If you have questions, let us know. Um, but we're going to try and show you as many pieces as possible. Um, it does get hard because as we were setting up today, we kept on saying, oh, we love that one. We love that one. So we could be here for three hours, um, but we will try to keep it short. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to John Shear, who is standing six feet away from me. Thank you, Jennifer. It's, it's nice to be here. This is my first adventure out of the house. Uh, but at any rate, uh, yes, I was here for 42 years, but I, re I was really young when I started. <laughs> yes. So we have um, an amazing collection of stoneware, thanks to Adam Weitzman. I'm sure it's the best collection in the world, actually. It's, it's a super. And it's interesting because these were everyday vessels that uh, was the plastic of the 19th century. Uh, they were used to, uh, to serve food, to store food. Uh, and you'll see there's a number of other things that were made of stoneware. And they're prized today because of the decorations. Uh, they're, they're wonderful examples of American folk art because all these decorations were done by untrained artists. Uh, so we can start with this, uh, this really neat jug here, uh, which was made in, in North Bay, New York, by, uh, by Jay Wald. And it shows a squirrel climbing a tree. So they depicted things that were of interest to the, to the decorators. Uh, in, most, in most cases, the potters were the decorators. And um, uh, so it's everyday life in Victorian America that's, uh, that's depicted, or things that might have picked the, uh, the, the potter's or the decorator's interest. So that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, a lot of stoneware was made in New York State because of our transportation system. We have a wonderful waterway system. We have the, the Hudson River and the Erie Canal, uh, which opened in 1825. It heads west and all of the feeder canals that come into the Erie Canal. So most of the stoneware manufacturers were along these waterways so that they could transport the clay that was necessary to produce stoneware from their 
uh, their uh, clay bays in uh, Bayonne, New Jersey, and also parts of Long Island. So the clay came from those areas, and they were able to get to the manufacturers along New York's waterway system. So there are there were potteries and uh, stoneware manufacturers all along these waterway systems. This is one of my favorite pieces. This was made in West Troy, uh, which is now known as Water Valite. Get this tag out of your way. And it's an elephant. Can you, can you see the elephant? And I just want you to notice his feet because he's wearing shoes. And the decorator who decorated this piece evidently saw a um, Civil War period trade token from an Albany shoe store. Uh, this thing is dated 1864, and it's an advertising token that depicts an elephant just like this wearing shoes. So it's interesting to see what inspired uh, some of these decorators. Uh, some interesting pieces along here. Um, stags were very popular, a decorative motif in Victorian America. And, and this uh, large croc uh, was made by Frederick Stetson Meyer of Rochester, New York, uh, probably in the 1870s. Most of the stoneware that we'll be showing you uh, dates to the 19th century, uh, anywhere from 1820 uh, to the 1880s. Um, is, was the heyday of stoneware manufacturing here in New York. Uh, and Stetson Meyer is known for these, this really deep blue uh, decoration and, uh, that you'll see. Let's take a look at some of the uh, other stoneware. As Jennifer said, uh, Adam likes the unusual pieces, the rare pieces. So uh, here's an unusual piece from Bennington, Vermont, and it depicts two lions. And uh, Bennington was a major pottery. Uh, the potters and the decorators moved around, and a lot of them got their start at the Bennington Pottery. Uh, from there, they went to Fort Edward, uh, they went to West Troy, they went to Utica. They really traveled around, the potters and the, uh, and the decorators, wherever they could get a good job. And as I, as I mentioned, most of the time, uh, the decorator was the potter himself. A few interesting pieces down here. Uh, sometimes they commemorated events and uh, happenings. Uh, and, and this, I don't know if I can drop this thing or not. And then this is for the centennial of 1876, uh, centennial of American independence. And you can see this guy's about ready to celebrate with his bottle of beer. Among some of the more unusual uh, decorations is this, uh, what the one on this butter churn. I want to mention that uh, these, the decorations are all in this cobalt blue color uh, because that would withstand the temperature, the high temperature that's necessary to, uh, to make this stoneware. Uh, it would be thrown on a wheel uh, and, and then uh, decorated in this cobalt blue paint, put into the, uh, the furnace fired up to, I think it's about 3,000 degrees, very high temperature. And while it was at the highest temperature, they would throw in this salt. And the salt would vaporize and, and form this film on it, this, uh, this glaze. And that's why it's, it's a salt glaze. And if you were to feel it, you would feel the bumps in the salt glaze. But the cobalt blue color would withstand this high firing. You're probably wondering what this design is. Well, this is actually a tree that's found on the island of St. Helena, Helena, where Napoleon uh, was held prisoner for a while. And it's a tree that grew to look like the profile of Napoleon himself. Here is a, a print that actually shows uh, the tree on that island. So this was something that interested the potter. This was the potter on this one was Thomas Harrington. And uh, it, he moved around too. At this time he was at Lyons, the Lyons Pottery, again on the Erie Canal. Oops.
Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, there's so many pieces of stone where it's hard to decide what to, <laughs> what to show. Get my mic back on here. But this, this is a, a really nice piece. It's a flower pot. And you can see there's holes drilled in the bottom so that the, the water can escape from it. And it was made for Nancy and Martha from G. Now, who was G? Well, the piece was made at the West Troy Pottery, uh, which is now Water Valite. It's just north of Albany. And uh, it was made at the William Warner Pottery. And doing research, I found out that there was a, a William's son, George, worked at the pottery. So uh, an educated guess could be that this might have been made by George Warner for some friends of his. Maybe they were relatives. Maybe they were aunts. I don't know. But there's a lot of really wonderful detail. I don't know if you can make this out, but it's an eagle. You see the eagle under the handle. And, a, and the decoration is all the way around. A super piece. And right next to it is this wonderful basket of flowers uh, made again by Thomas Harrington. At that time, he was in Lyons, New York. This is a beautiful horse, a speckled, speckled horse. And this also was made by Thomas Harrington of Lyons. Some of the nicest decoration came out of these potteries near Rochester, New York. Thomas Harrington, John Berger, um, and we think that they did their own decoration. A couple interesting uh, pieces here on the uh, table is, is this was the cover piece for the book. It's a beautiful, beautiful flask. And it's attributed to uh, Henry Remy of New York City. How old is this piece? The piece is dated. I can tell you exactly how old it is. It was uh, made February 14th, 1804. Perhaps a Valentine's Day present for someone. Uh, it's marked Hed Henry Edoson. And I have actually found him in tax records and business records uh, in New Jersey, an area that would be in commuting distance to Manhattan. And we think that possibly, and here's his initials on the other side, H-E, we think that he might have been one of the workers at Henry Remy's pottery. Quite often, the people who worked at the potteries, with le uh, at the end of the day, they had leftover clay, and they'd make things for themselves or for their families. So this could be one of those uh, things. Notice the, uh, the leaves, the shape of the leaves. This is indicative of Henry Remy's work. So uh, if this is attributed to Henry Remy on the basis of this design, which is found on a signed work or several signed works by Henry Remy. And uh, uh, this uh, inkwell is also attributed to, uh, to Henry Remy. In fact, it's, it's really quite nice because it's, it's initialed PB, we don't know who that is, and it's dated 1797. So we have two signed pieces here by Henry Remy, a 1797 inkwell in this beautiful, beautiful flask. Just X, really nice. And I'm going to let Jennifer uh, talk about a couple pieces here. Yes, we all, we love, love, love the flask. It's one of the, the prize pieces in the collection. And I should mention that when the museum is open, we do have uh, 45 pieces on permanent display uh, downstairs on the first floor. And uh, as soon as we open, we hope to um, shuffle some of these around so more of them can um, be. What's the oldest piece in the collection? The oldest piece in the collection, John, do you have any? That's, those are pretty early. 1804. We have, uh, I'll be showing you one okay. of the earlier later on. Stay tuned. Stay uh, tuned. 1790s. Okay. So I thought I would show um, this arm flask, which isn't attributed to anybody particular, but it's a workman's flask. And folks would put it on their arm and then hold it that way. And we did have a researcher in here um, at some point years ago who said that this form was specific to New York State. 
Um, but since there's no maker's mark, we can't um, figure that out completely. I also pulled um, a sweet little heart-shaped inkwell. With no maker's mark. But do you know who it is, John? I do. Uh, it's attributed to uh, Paul Cushman of oh. Albany, and it descended in his family. And that's why John Shear's here today. <laughs> and then the last piece I thought I would show is this um, little handled ovoid crock um, from Crolius, um, who was an African American potter in New York City fairly early. Um, and Crolius was involved, he was an immigrant from Haiti. He was involved with the Haitian Revolution and then um, immigrated to New York City where he was one of the few African American potters. Um, he was also very involved with the African American church in New York City and we have another piece by him which we'll show you in a little bit. It, it, it was actually Camara. Camara. Who did I say? Oh, Crolius. Camara. Excuse me. Thomas Camara. And then um, for the last part of the tour, we thought we would show you the um, storage cabinets. Um, as you can see, we're kind of going through storage. At this point, um, because we don't have any room for storage cabinets, uh, the pieces kind of go wherever we can fit them. But um, we do have several hundred pieces in cabinets. So this is, I guess, stoneware row, for lack of a better, lack of a better term. Um, John, you want to start? With this first case. The doors for you. Okay. Well, as I as, as I mentioned, um, the potters depicted things that they were familiar with, things that they enjoyed. So we have a jug here, guy fishing. Sort of interesting. And then this piece here, this extraordinary tall jug was made in Poughkeepsie by John Kerr and Philip Redinger. Uh, it's not marked, uh, but it's attributed because we find this tree and those sort of uh, animals on other works and the birds in the trees. Can you see the birds in the trees? And uh, it's unusual and it was made in two pieces. Uh, Jennifer, can you see where that's made? Maybe you could point that out, right? Yeah, right, right there, there is where it's joined. So it's an extraordinary piece. And what potters did was they did these extraordinary pieces as advertising pieces. They would have them in their store window to show what they could do. <clears throat> okay, we're back again. And uh, I just pulled this particular jug, which is a really handsome uh, jug and you can see it says Benjamin Harrison Harrington Harrington and it's dated and the date on it is June the 1st 1823 and AET 22 at age 22 this is a memorial piece for Benjamin Harrington uh, he was a uh, Potter from Schenectady, actually, but he was working at the pottery in Norwich, Connecticut, and he drowned uh, th uh, that day. Uh, and he has his initials back here, B H. And we found a newspaper notice of his death, and so this was made by his fellow potters at the po at the uh, uh, pottery where he worked as a memorial uh, to Benjamin Harrington. Uh, of Schenectady. You can see it's got a got an urn on this side and it's just uh, it's really a, a, a wonderful piece and, and has so much history to it. The initials underneath the handles JL on this side and HT on this side were the potters who made the jug uh, at the Norwich Pottery and uh, I don't remember their uh, names offhand, but if you buy the book, all that information is there. Uh, this was the early picture I was telling you about, uh, probably about 1796 or thereabouts. And that 
It's, it's uh, uh, made attributed to Crolius, New York City. But notice the, the animal. That's a lion. That's an early depiction of a lion. And uh, there was a newspaper advertisement in a New York City paper uh, about this lion being exhibited in New York City. And we think that the uh, uh, potter was inspired by this exhibition of a lion. Can you imagine what it must have been to see an animal like that, uh, never having seen one before? Uh, traveling menageries were very popular and becoming even more popular. Uh, another interesting piece. This was made at the West Troy Pottery, and it depicts a race course, racetrack. And these horses are running around the racetrack. Uh, there's a pennant here flying. And it says Island Park. And Island Park was a racetrack on an island just north of Albany in Menans. And, and, and the West Troy Pottery was right near the racetrack. They could probably see the racetrack from the pottery. So that's sort of interesting. Uh, as I say, they depicted every, everyday life on these pieces. That's a fireman with his speaking trumpet. And we see Courier and Ives prints that show this subject matter. And one wonders if maybe the decorator were inspi was inspired by, uh, by one of those prints by Courier and Ives. Uh, this is a water cooler. We, we call it a water cooler. It could have had could have had rum or whiskey or something like that in it. Uh, and it's a commemorative piece. It was made as a presentation piece uh, to Dr. Jonathan Sherwood. Fairfield, of the Fairfield Academy, which is near Utica. And uh, it was a medical college. And uh, Jonathan Sherwood was a student there, and he graduated in 1817, and he became employed there, and he worked there at the academy for many years, and this water cooler was in his office, probably presented to him when he graduated, 1817. The piece is attributed to uh, uh, Jonas and Calvin Boynton of Albany, New York, potters from Albany, New York. Okay, back again. Sorry for the interruption. Um, this particular jug was made by D. Weston of Ellenville down in the Hudson Valley. And uh, this guy sort of had a little bit of humor with him because he's depicted an image of a jug on a jug. <laughs> um, this is an interesting piece made by uh, Haxton Ottman and Company of Fort Edward, New York. As you can see from the reading of where these, pla these pieces are made, they were made in virtually every area of New York State. And we think that this depicts uh, Abraham Lincoln. We think this might be a, and they would uh, put images, photographs, or images of people uh, in the basket. And so this appears to be uh, honoring Abraham Lincoln. This is a large four gallon. The numbers on these pieces, by the way, just to let you know, indicate the size of the container. So this is four, so it would, uh, it would hold four gallons. And it's the same with the Crocs. Um, this was made uh, by J. and E. Norton, Bennington, New York. And we do know who the decorator is on this. Uh, Notice the fence, which appears in a lot of this decorator's images. Quite often there are deer or stags laying down in a fenced field. That was a typical scene used by John Hilfringer. He was a potter. He worked at the Bennington Pottery, but then he went into the Civil War. And he got wounded and injured, 
And when he came out of the Civil War, he was uh, not as strong as he was. He was weak. And so he couldn't do the heavy work of actually, actually making these uh, stoneware vessels. So he became solely a decorator. And he moved around to uh, the many potteries, the ones at Fort Edward, the ones in Bennington, um, et cetera. So uh, this one we do know that was, it's attributed to John Hilfinger uh, because we do know what his designs looked like. And I'm going to let Jennifer talk about some of these other pieces here. In the last couple pieces we're going to take a look at, um, I've got another piece here from Thomas Camara from New York City. Not Crolius, Camara. Um, and this one is a form that we haven't seen yet today, and it's an oyster jar, um, which is kind of interesting. It's got a nice, nice glaze on it. Um, I think we have one other oyster jar in the collection, but it's not labeled. Um, and then uh, this last churn um, is from Whitmore in Havana, New York. And so thank you for bearing with us through all of our technical difficulties. Like I mentioned, we don't um, have Wi-Fi in the collection area. Um, but I would like to thank John Shear, Senior Historian Emeritus, for coming in uh, today. This was the first time he was sprung from his house since mid-March. Um, so we're thrilled about that. And then I'd also like to have a, uh, give Adam Weitzman a big thank you for donating this remarkable collection to the State Museum and to the people of the state of New York um, and for being uh, an all-around fantastic donor. Um, so if anybody would ever like to come in and make an appointment to view these pieces after we are officially opened, um, you can contact us here at the museum. We have a bunch of research materials devoted to stoneware um, and we just love to showcase these pieces. So thank you very much.